Hello and welcome to the two minute warning interview where we ask what is next and what should be next in the global energy transition. Is the upheaval that we're seeing in the global energy market enough? Is it moving fast enough to hit those climate goals of the Paris Agreement and more recently announced net zero goals? At the moment, the resounding answer is no. And that's something that we're going to go into a little bit today, specifically to do with India. My name is Michelle Meineke. I'm the director of the Energy Transition Dialogues at Gulf Intelligence. And I'm very glad to have Arunaba Ghosh here today. He is the Chief Executive Officer of the Council on Energy and Environment and Water, also known as CEW. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Michelle. I know, thank you. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to uh, your answers to some of the questions I'm going to be shooting your way. Let's just start with a bit of a broader picture uh, when it comes to India and its, its overall greening efforts. Can you just give us a quick rundown of what states, status rather that India is at when it comes to its energy transition and its push towards decarbonisation? Michelle, India is going through multiple energy transitions, not just one. Um, mm. In just the last two decades, about uh, 300 million uh, people have got access to uh, electricity or about 700 million people have got access to clean cooking energy uh, for the first time, right? To and interrupt you, sorry, did you say 300 million? Yes. So to give an idea to the listeners, that's not far off the total population of the US. That's right. And, give and an idea of context. That, and a lot of that has happened just in the last uh, five or seven years. So there's been a big push of just getting people access to modern energy, whether it's electricity or, or cooking fuel. And then there's uh, another energy transition that's underway, which is to clean up the energy mix. Uh, you know, uh, Michelle, about... 10 years ago, when I set up CEW, we had uh, less than 2,000 megawatts of um, solar capacity in the country. We now have 94,000 megawatts of wind and solar capacity. If you add large hydro, we're up to almost 140,000 megawatts of renewables, uh, on track to a target that India had put for, its, for, for itself, 175,000 megawatts by 2022. Um, mm. but this is this is a huge shift in two ways. One, just in absolute terms, but the other is in relative terms, right? Our entire electricity system is about 380,000 megawatts. Um, it's against that that now India has plans to have 450,000 megawatts of renewables by 2030. Right? So you're almost building <clears throat> one and a half times your existing electricity system as renewable energy within the next 10 years, right? Um, in a, in a post-COVID economic and social environment. Exactly, and at a much lower level of per capita income than any of the countries in the developed world or even a large emerging economy like China, right? Mm. So um, that's, the, that's the way it's going. So I call it an energy uh, revolution, not an energy transition. Um, and that will then uh, drive transformations in other sectors where you start looking beyond just the decarbonization of the power sector to look at how do you decarbonize other sectors that can use cleaner electricity. So then we have targets for, say, 30% of our vehicles being sold in 2030 to be electric. Uh, what would that mean? That would mean setting up two and a half million charging stations, for instance. Um, between now and 2030. Right? The so scale of everything in India, do you think that's something that people just forget? That the scale of everything that has to be done is just so magnified? I, I think people forget that within India and outside India. I recall, if you, if you just go back to the point I made about energy access, I recall in 2013, 2014, I uh, made a speech saying that we would need to electrify 750 households every hour to get um, electricity to, to every household. And then, you know, we conducted the world's largest survey on energy access. We showed how in every village, in, 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 within a village, which, which household doesn't have a wire or where the wire is snapped or where the transformer is not there. And, uh, and India did it. 
uh, there's now nearly 98% of the households that are connected to an electricity wire. Now, of course, that might be just powering up a single light bulb. Uh, but as households get access to that first taste of modern energy, then the demand will rise. So our effort now is how do we make sure that every new household that's connected or every new appliance that you use is more efficient than the last one. Mm. Right? So there is this massive countrywide program on LED light bulbs. So again, about 400 million such light bulbs have been sold, uh, bringing down the price of that light bulb from over 300 rupees to about 50 rupees. Right? Cool. So it's the, the scale is both daunting. Sorry, in what time frame was that? Sorry to interrupt you. What time frame was that? That's... That, that program began in a sort of pilot phase in around 2011, 12. And then again, okay. it scaled from 2014, 15 onwards. Um, and there's, a, there's an app that you can check in real time how many LED light bulbs are being deployed in the country. But the so in seven to 10 it, years, you saw the price plummet to that degree. And just the, seven price ten drop, the price drop, Michelle, happened in, in, in about two or three years. Thanks. Wow. And, and, and it, it's, it's the same logic we apply to vaccines, right? That when yes. you're offering that big advanced market commitment, you're, you're triggering the innovation, you're triggering the, the economy of scale and the manufacturing. But then it's not just a subsidy, you're buying it in bulk, but then selling it on to the final consumer at a much lower mm -hmm. rate. Mm -hmm. So can we do that with uh, ceiling fans? Can we do that with air conditioners? You know, the, the fastest growth in air conditioner demand is going to be in India over the next two decades. Eight-fold increase in, in, air, in cooling demand, right? So how do we make sure millions of new air conditioners will be cleaner, use more climate-friendly refrigerants, will be more efficient? How do we make sure that, um, uh, that, that the... 63 million micro, small, medium enterprises in India, only half of which use electricity as their source of energy, ship to electricity and ship to clean electricity, right? Mm. That's another transformation. Let's look at agriculture. Uh, we've got 30 million irrigation pump sets in the country. Um, we now have a plan and those pump sets run on diesel and, and, and kind of grid connected electricity. We now have a plan in the country to have nearly 3 million solar irrigation pump sets deployed. India already has more solar irrigation pump sets deployed than any other country in the world. How, when, when, when will those be deployed by? What, what's the time? Is, time? Again, the, there is not an exact set timeline, but it's within the next four or five years. So we at, at my organization, we're looking at in every district where do you have the maximum return on investment for deploying something like That's this. Still ambitious. Three million in up to five years is still ambitious, Absolutely. isn't it? Absolutely. I'll give you another example, and and this is the and each of these examples it illustrates why the energy transition has to be brought closer to people. So, in the rural economy, uh, we found that using distributed energy to power up not just households of a poor farmer, but you know income generating activities. It could be a milk chilling center, it could be a food processing center, a small textile mm -hmm. unit. It's a $50 billion opportunity uh, wow. in rural India with existing proven technologies, right? So in, in, at CW, we've kicked off a program called Powering Livelihoods and where we mm -hmm. are you know, investing in some of these startups to help them scale. So the point is the energy transition is critical from a planetary perspective, but bringing it closer to the people makes it not a conversation that you have at the margins of sort of environmental discourse, but in the mainstream of your development discourse, right? Whether it is the power sector, whether it's small business, whether it's large business, whether it's transportation, whether it's agriculture, whether it's the rural economy, you can begin to bring the energy transition closer to people and make it therefore much more sustainable socially and politically, not just environmentally. Indeed, it's, it's, bring, it's bringing it home very much and, and it brings around that social justice as well as, well as that broader picture. You, you mentioned about the, the 2022 uh, target. 
is 175 gigawatts by 2022 is that still on the cards for the end of that year is that still viable on a national basis it, it's on the cards in terms of stated policy uh, mm -hmm. i think in terms of deployment there might be a delay of a few months so as i said we've got with large hydropower we're already at about 140,000 megawatts mm. Yeah. Um, so what is likely to happen in the next about 18, 19 months, Michelle, is that a lot of tenders will be issued for the remaining capacity. Uh, so what India follows is a reverse auction process. And mm -hmm. that means that in every round of the auctions, you're bringing down the cost of renewable energy uh, lower than what it was earlier. Right. So we are now at about three US cents or even lower. Um, so I think there will be a lot of tenders announced, a lot of auctions mm -hmm. that will happen, but not all of that get, might get deployed. The last 30, 35,000 megawatts might not get fully deployed, but it, it'll be maybe a few months later, a year later. What's more interesting is this 450,000 megawatt target. Yes. Right? Because uh, the, the nationally determined contribution that we announced in the Paris Climate Agreement was that we would have 40% of our electricity generation capacity would be non-fossil by 2030. Mm. Guess what? We're already at 38%, right? Mm. Um, so the, and that's with the existing capacity that we've deployed. So the 450,000 megawatts will be an immense increase in the share of renewables as capacity in the electricity system. Well what percentage does that take you to? Because the, the goal is 40 by 2030. You're currently at 38, which is astonishing. Um, what does that percent, what does that for, it what does that take be, us to? Uh, somewhere in the order of 55, 60%, if not more. But, but remember, Michelle, this is the installed capacity. Generation mm -hmm. share is always lower because renewables yes. have lower efficiency than a coal power plant, right? which means that the investments that are made on the storage technology side are increasingly what are called round the clock tenders. So you're doing hybrids of solar and wind to make sure that even with intermittent renewables, you still can get a larger share of the generation coming from renewables, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if that happens, that then triggers uh, you know, much more application of that technology uh, in those other sectors. And One also the thing. general push as well towards energy efficiency more broadly as well may see that installed versus generation gap narrowing up to 2030 by, by a few percentage points, which of course translates in, into quite a bit of uh, volume with, the, with that broader push. And that's, that's absolutely right. That's why we are pushing very hard on more energy efficient appliances because, you know, uh, when you and I imagine we get our first electricity connection and then we want to buy a light bulb, then a television, then a toaster or whatever, right? Uh, it just ramps up the, the electricity demand. But one more thing, we've been looking at heavy industry. Now, you know, we, we, are, we produce about 150 million tons of steel. We plan to produce about 300 million tons of steel. Now, can we do that in a cleaner way, right? Um, so there's this uh, newly announced national hydrogen energy mission uh, that India has put out and, and my organization has been involved in, in, in that. Um, now, hydrogen, green hydrogen uh, derived from renewables can help with energy storage, can help mm. with resistance rate, and can help with decarbonizing your heavy industry. Mm, but the hardest and areas, indeed. And, and, and if I wanted to use that green hydrogen just for say steel production, I would need 400 gigawatts of renewables just for the hydrogen needed for steel. So it's kind of this exponential rise of, of renewables. It's obviously not going to be on autopilot. And that's the important thing. That's where policy comes in, policy direction comes in, contract sanctity comes in. Um, mm -hmm and lowering the risks and lowering the cost of finance. You know, even now 60% of our tariffs is the cost of finance. Um, so if I can keep de-risking the investments, I can keep bringing down renewable energy tariffs. They're already lower than coal, but I can bring mm -hmm. them down even further. Well, coal is actually something I wanted to chat about, but before we go on to that, I wanted to, I wanted to run this by you. Last week, one of our speakers said that they see India setting a 2070 net zero target, if at all, certainly not before 2070. Mm -hmm. Simply there's too much to do. The, the nation is developing, the population is growing, things we've already touched upon. 
and uh, the economy is growing and so on. And, and this is going back to an age-old argument between developed and developing nations and who should go first and you have your gold already, we're still accruing our gold and, and so on. But I just wanted to hear your point of view with net zero. How high is this on India's priority list? How important is it for India to do it from a reputational basis on the global stage? We have some of the world's biggest economies stepping forward and saying, right, we'll, we'll commit. Now, of course, I'm, we're well aware committing and doing it are two very different things. But what, what is your take on India and net zero? Well, at CEW, Michelle, we brought out the very first analysis of different pathways for India to get to net zero. And here's the thing that um, your, your listeners need to internalize. India has not peaked its emissions yet. You know, um, the UK, for instance, peaked its emissions in 1973. So it has a 77 year transition period to get to net zero. The EU has a 71 year transition period. The US will have a 43 year transition period. Now, if India peaked in say 2030 and aimed for net zero by 2050, that's a shorter time transition period than any country has ever done, right? Mm -hmm. which is why we also looked at a peak in 2040 and net zero in 2070, or even a peak in 2050 and net zero in 2090 would still mean that India's emissions in the last and this century would be lower than that of the US, China, or European Union. If it got to net zero in 2070, for instance, then even its emissions in this century, looking forward, would be lower than what US and China will put out, despite their- Combined. Uh, no, well, individually. Oh, individually. Yeah, despite yeah. their net zero targets. So here's how I would reframe the net zero conversation. Number one, I believe, yes, we should set a net zero target. And that should give them the direction of travel and the certainty to uh, not just the world outside, but to the markets. Second, we should focus on the near-term targets. And that's where the strength of India's energy transition comes in. India is the only G20 country whose actions are consistent with a two degree Celsius world and which is already on track to achieving its uh, Paris goals. So making those near-term targets far more aggressive would keep adding credibility to the long-term certainty. Not to play the devil's advocate, that 20 years that you mentioned, uh, you know, 73, 71, so on, but 20 years for, for India, if, if, if potentially mm -hmm. on one of those scenarios you, you touched upon, would, would, to play the devil's advocate, would it be easier, though, that for those 20 years or, say, a 30, 40-year period, which is still very tight, but would it, is that not more viable considering the cost of renewables and, and the environment that we're dealing with now? And also that if more and more infrastructure now is built on a cleaner basis, as is being done, as we're already seeing very much in India, that the scale up of that means that the, that transition period, that 70, 70 plus years for the UK, for example, can be dramatically reduced. Not saying it's fair, but for the, for the sake of the, the, the planet, uh, that it can be shortened. Is that, is that a viable argument, do you think? I, I, I... So that's exactly what my third point was going to be about. Oh, there we go. We read each think, other's minds. Think, we, we didn't even know. <laughs> I think India should have something. I, I, I've written about this publicly that we should think about contingent commitments. The, the estimates we have today are already going on our estimations of reductions in technology or the availability of investment capital. Um, so a 2050 or a 2060 or 2070 net zero should then become contingent on availability of more technology or te technological transformation, et cetera, by virtue of which we could then bring the targets forward. So the, that's exactly why I said that the net zero announcement should be there because it sets a direction of travel. It says yes. we're all serious about this, but it's like, you know, you can step on the accelerator more if you see that the enabling conditions are becoming easier of for you. And, 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 and that's what we did in the last 10 years with, with renewables. As I said, we had less than 2,000 megawatts of, uh, not 2,000, we had less than 20 megawatts of solar in 2010. And, 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 and now we have, you know, 94,000. Because oh, the, trans the transformation the, 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 the incredible. 
But just, so would you would you envisage a, a, 20, a net zero target by say 2070 based on your research? Would you see that as being a reasonable step? I think it's it, it's a reasonable no let me say I think it's a, it's it's still going to be extremely aggressive in terms of the effort needed mm -hmm. that said I would say it is a reasonable bet to take um, because the final point I want to make on this question Michelle, is not when is India's net zero year going to be the bigger question is what, how will India's climate policy help to transform the economy to be more resilient and more competitive in a climate changed world? Mm -hmm. And once we start asking ourselves that question, then we ask ourselves, am I gonna make steel in 2050? Yes. Is it gonna follow the same process as now? Perhaps mm -hmm. not. So can I start working on this technology? Do I want to export cars in 2040? Yes. Will it be an ICE engine car? Very unlikely. So how can I speed it up, right? So when you start thinking about it from an overall economy strategy point of view, uh, tapping into the technologies, becoming co-developers of emerging disruptive technologies, then you don't see it only as something you announce in an international negotiation. You see it as a trigger as one more trigger uh, in, in, in that very aggressive energy revolution that you're already on. And I think all countries have that question to answer. All countries, whether they've announced net zero or not, they need to be answering that question. We're running out of time fast, but I have to get one more question into you that I'm, I'm keen to hear your views on. Um, this has all been very interesting so far as well. So I want to ask you about the elephant in the room, and that is coal and what is going to be India's future with coal. We know that it's a huge consumer, not, not obviously not as big as China. China's got just over 50% of global consumption. Um, but when it, when it comes to India, it's, it's still a mega, mega player. And uh, there, are, there are still projects going on. There are still big investments being made. So again, to be realistic here, this isn't an overnight change. This is a huge a huge ship that needs to be turned around. It's a huge population, 1.4 billion, I believe, by 2024. And, and we've already discussed a lot of the complexities that are involved in this energy transition stroke revolution to go by your phrasing. So talking about coal against that backdrop, what do you expect to see happening in the next couple of years when it comes to India and coal? I think the way we need to think about our coal conundrum is... Um, put it in three different buckets. One is the future electricity system. Second is the legacy electricity system. And the third is the use of coal in heavy industry. Right? When we look at future electricity system, as I mentioned, renewables are already cheaper mm. than coal. Last five years, we bring out the investment trends report every year along with the IEA. Uh, we see renewables investment has been outpacing some of our investment consistently. So within the next, including storage costs, within somewhere in the next two to five, seven year period, there's going to be parity of renewables plus storage with coal. And therefore, there'll be no case to build any future mm. coal power plants. That still leaves us with the two other pieces. How do we retire the older coal plants in, a, in an orderly manner so that number one, we are able to tap into our newer coal fleet, which is more efficient and shut down the older inefficient plants, right? Um, and that way you're automatically reducing emissions, but you're also increasing the efficiency in the system. Um, but then finally will come the use of coal in iron and steel, in cement, in aluminium, and things like that. And that's where the bets on those alternative technologies uh, will become very important, whether it's green hydrogen, whether it's natural gas, then transitioning to green hydrogen will become important to start thinking about very seriously. But underlying all of this, Michelle, is also the labor transition, right? You've, mm. got, you've got about uh, half a million people employed in in, in coal mining or some of the power and so forth. Now, of course, 
our renewable energy targets are going to create many, many more jobs because solar, wind, distributed energy have a much higher employment coefficient. However, you still have these people who are concentrated in the cold belt of the country and you cannot simply ignore them. No, so of course. what kind of financing strategy will help with early retirement, retraining, insurance cushion, social safety nets mm -hmm. for these families? It's not 500 million, 500,000 workers, it's 500,000 families, right? Mm -hmm. um, and creating that social safety net will be absolutely critical towards creating the political um, case that the energy transition is not anti-people. Excellent. Thank you very much. That's uh, very comprehensive. And also, as you've touched on uh, hydrogen as well, I would like to invite you to speak on our hydrogen series, which we'll follow up with after, after this event. So I think that would be fascinating to hear your thoughts on that. A huge amount to think about there. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you. Uh, it's a huge, a huge amount to think about. And it's also uh, inspiring and uh, reassuring to see what progress India is making as well. And how and how things have progressed so significantly and it's good to put a bit of a spotlight on that as well so thank you very much and i uh, hope you can join us again thank you michelle thank you I look forward to having that all again thank you so much thank you very much thank you